Hey everybody, this is Alexander Fitzgerald or Sassinato doing another one of my webinars for Jonathan Little. Today we are going to be discussing exploitative continuation bet sizing, refining our basics. Why you should change your bet sizes. 90 plus percent of your opponents in an HBT or in a low stakes cash games have no idea who you are. They are generally playing their hand and not getting too calibrated. Versus players like this, you can manipulate them with some basic bet changes. Today I'm going to show you how to exploit basic regulars so you can make more money. So the truth is guys, with the vast majority of opponents, they're more or less playing their cards in their fixed strategy. And if you know what those fixed strategies tend to be, and they tend to be the same ones all over the world, uh, just because people tend to learn poker the same way, you can manipulate them somewhat. So we're going to talk about that today. But what about balancing is something a lot of people ask. Balancing is important when you're playing against higher level opponents. I, I, I was lucky enough to make a final table in Prague uh, at the butt end of 2016, for example. And there I had to do a lot of balancing because versus very educated opponents, there's no C betting 100% of the time. But it, it's also important to be balancing when you play the same people every day. And in WSOP, 2Ks and higher, Euro 1Ks and higher, and cash games will require, require balancing uh, just because you're going to be playing against the same people every day. But for the vast majority of people, you only get so many hands with them. It's going to be about 40 or 50. And if they've never really seen you, and that, that has to go with cash games or tournaments as well, if they've never really seen you, in those 40 and 50 hands, they're going to have their way, they're going to react, and that's going to be it, and we can manipulate them. This playbook, I use this playbook often when I'm playing against people the first time. It's been very useful in stateside WPTs, up to 3.5Ks, and most tournaments in Vegas, uh, the higher stakes Venetians, that, that's when people start attacking your C-bats a little bit more, and obviously WCP 2Ks and higher. Uh, it works great in tournaments up to $200 weekday tournaments in uh, online tournaments. So online, if you're playing Sunday majors, you're fine. Uh, if you're playing up to 109s during the weekdays, you're fine. But those 162 $200 daily tournaments, that that's where people start attacking you online. So I wouldn't use this stuff as much there. And again, it has to do with the player base. If it's a very educated player base, which is more rare than people realize, they're going to be attacking CBETs quite frequently. Uh, but the vast majority of even regs that make a little money, the way they make their money is they open when people are unlikely to 3-bet them. They 3-bet when people are unlikely to 4-bet them. And they have a pretty good C-betting strategy themselves. If they call you from the big blind, for example, maybe they're just looking to hit a piece of the flop and that's where we can get a little something. But there's different ways to go about this. Let's let's take a look at let's take a look at a hypothetical situation. So here uh, you have 10-7 of diamonds on the button. You raise to two and a half times the big blind. The big blind calls you. The board comes eight of clubs, four of diamonds, three of spades. It gets checked to you. Of these options, which one would you like to take? You could even bet larger. Why do you think we should bet larger there? So the, the first one we're gonna analyze is betting 66 to 75% pot. And you'll notice most people bet half pot, but I put 66 or 75. Now, why is that? Let me ask you something. When you continuation bet here, what is the most important thought? 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 Anyone want to guess in the chat what the most important thing is to think of here? Now, the reason, guys, I hammered on this so much, so... I, uh, long story short, I put together a playbook for my students that was very successful with a lot of them. And then with certain students who were just as smart as the other ones, I noticed they weren't being as successful. And that really confused me. 
Because some of these guys were so intelligent, I wasn't even in their zip code. And eventually, so I did some reading. I was trying to figure out why do people, why can people perform well when they study and during simulations, but not so much in the field. And something I found that was shared by a lot of elite performers is the focus on one, two, or three items. So Navy SEALs, for example, in those guys, some of them are multilingual demolition experts, bodybuilders, right? Like if there's anybody who can remember anything, it would be those guys. Well, when they when they go into the field, they only are given one, two, or three things to remember. Uh, if any of you follow American football, Bill Belichick, uh, the head coach of the New England Patriots, probably the most successful dynasty of all time in the NFL, when he is at halftime and he's giving people things to remember for the second half, he has a rule that it has to be three things. It can't be more than three things. It can be one thing, two things, or three things, but it can't be four. And I find we get more results in No Limit Hold'em when we focus on specific thoughts, okay? Because let's be honest, we've all looked at this situation a hundred times before, and there's a lot of things to look at. One person in the chat said, could he possibly check raise me? Uh, what am I trying to set up on the turn and river? Uh, does that board hit his range or my range more? All of that stuff is great, but we can start with one thought that if we understand this question and the answer of it, it makes everything else superfluous, not as big of a deal. That's where we should start from. Now, obviously, if you get a more complex opponent, you do have to broaden out the thoughts you are thinking to become a little bit more exacting in your ways. But for the vast majority of poker hands, we don't have to go that com complicated. I still use what we're gonna talk about here, even in Atlantic City WPTs and whatnot. So you want to see bet to fold out high cards. The biggest question to ask yourself here is how can I get rid of the high cards? And I bet a lot of you answered that. You were saying, how can I get him to just fold with when he missed this board? Yeah, high cards, okay, different phrasing, but the same thing. Now here's my question. You want to see bet to fold out high cards, right? Will betting half pot do that? If you know, tell me, because I don't know. A lot of guys will call with their ace highs of any kind with a half pot bet when there's two wheel cards out there. Others will fold. It's a little more likely, actually much more likely, they'll fold if I bet bigger, and obviously less likely they'll fold if I bet smaller. Let's say I bet this much, 450. How often does this need to work, guys? What do you do mathematically to figure out how often this works? This is one of the first things I learned when I started learning poker very beginning. This is the beginning of your poker studies. Well, you do 450, the amount you're risking, divided by the pot you're going to get back when he folds. Uh, because that 450 doesn't go off into the ether. It comes back to you if uh, you're right and he folds. So you do 450 divided by 1080 here. And you're going to find that your bet as a complete bluff needs to work 41.6 repeating percent of the time. And if anybody is a little puzzled why it's an uneven number there, remember the ante is 10 here. So the reason you bet this large is because if you get the guy to fold high cards on most boards without two cards nine or higher, uh, then you're printing money. But let me say that, that was a little confusing. If the board does not have two cards nine or higher, then generally the person has mostly high cards. If you get him to fold those high cards, almost any bet up to the size of the pot will be profitable. Many basic players will fall for the tactic I just showed you. Their whole life, 
they have seen half pot size bets. You put out a slightly larger bet, a lot of guys will go, huh, that's weird. And then they muck their high card, which isn't all we want. That's it. We're not expecting them to fold pairs. That's a big ask. But maybe just a bare ace, right? That doesn't have a gut shot. Hell, I still have guys in WPTs that fall for this tactic, guys. I would not teach it to you if I did not use it myself. And this is something you can bring up all the time with satellite winners or like okay regs that are used to dealing with half pot size bets. Oh, if you're a if you're an older gentleman or lady, they're just going to think you have the nuts when you bet bigger. Actually, if they fold, you should apply, you should beef that up. Right after they fold, just go, I hate pocket jacks or something like that. That is an awesome image to have. Now, if you had to pick another answer here, which one would it be? There is one other exploitative play here, which requires a bit more finesse. So let's say you bet 200 here into 630. And he calls. The turn is the queen of hearts. Now what do you do? You would bet just a little over half pot. Anything over half pot would be good. Why would I do that? Well, let's go back to the flop. When we bet that small and he calls, what do you think he is calling with? What do we think he's calling with? Let's make this a group activity. Well, now he's probably calling me with all of his ace highs because come on guys, we all fall for this tiny bet. We have a high card. We feel weak folding. I know all about this play and I'll tell you what, if I have ace seven here, and someone bets 200, I feel really silly folding. But the problem is, what happens if the guy calls with ace high? We all fall for this tiny bet, we have a high card, we feel weak folding, and that's when we get them, or that's when they get us, rather. Because that turn comes, and it's anything but an ace, and we fire anything slightly above half pod, and it looks like we're trying to get value now. So we're betting 550 here to win 1580. Our bet needs to work as a pure bluff 35% of the time. So we're going to round up. So what does that mean? What's the next thing I'm going to say, guys? If our bet needs to work as a pure bluff 35% of the time, what does that mean for our opponent? He needs to defend with 65% of his hands. However, if we throw a queen out there and look at the statistics, we find that he doesn't even have a pair 45% of the time, which means even if he defends with every pair and draw, he's not defending 65% of his hands. He's only defending 55% of his hands. I love this play because most guys will call with a high card or a gut shot once versus a small bet because probably they should. But then on the turn, when they miss and you fire a quote substantial bet out there, they'll let it go. What they don't realize is they're getting worked. There's one other bet you can do here. I only use it maybe 10% of the time, but I'll use it with a young guy who's getting angry with me. I love these in Planet Hollywood tournaments, small events in Europe, WSOPC events. Let's see if you can get this. This also works on online too. You get a lot of LOLs in the chat. All right, guys, what do you think it is? Time is up. You can just bet a little 850 there into the pot of 630. So you bet 850. Guys, how do I figure out how often this needs to work? If this were poker 101, this is the first thing they would teach you. You do 850 divided by 1480. That means our bet as a pure bluff needs to work 57% of the time. So what does that mean, guys, for our opponent? I'm going to pause here for a second. If you haven't thought about it, think about it. It means he needs to defend with 43% of his hands. 
The problem is if he defends with any pair, that's only 35% of his range. This is a fun, uh, for those of you who are familiar with baseball, I call this the changeup, just because nobody expects it. And you get, with young guys, I love this play because you get a lot of poo and then they fold, which is fine. I, I'm, I'm fine looking dumb, right? But it's been a long time since I did this bet and somebody figured out what I was doing and they decided to raise or something. Because most of the time in the States, I, I don't know why this is, but most people, as long as you don't leave them looking stupid, they'll fold. That's at low and middle stakes. And if it's like a WPT in Baltimore, that's a lot of satellite winners and stuff like that, right? Despite it being a more substantial buy-in, it's going to be people that generally play 500s and 400s and stuff like that. So as long as you're not, as long as you're allowing them to save face, they'll usually let it go. And in this case, in common poker parlance, you're kind of seen as the nut case here. So it's not really on them to feel silly. Some final notes, guys. Everything we looked at had to do with the big blind calling you. We started with that situation because it is the most common continuation betting setting in No Limit Hold'em. Do not do these bet sizes versus a cold caller. I'm going to repeat that. Do not do these bet sizes versus a cold caller. A 12% cold calling range is much different than a 35% big blind flatting range. So this is a common misconception that comes up every time I teach this, which is, oh, betting really big to fold out high cards is good versus the big blind calling you. I guess it's pretty good all the time. Well, I'm really glad that you understand now that the big blind calls with too many hands and is on most boards is going to have mostly high cards and you can get away with a really big bet, but that's because they're calling with 35, 40% of the hands, almost regardless of where you raise. That's why we're focusing on that spot to begin with, it, which is go count the number of times the big blind calls you and it's just you and him in any medium stakes tournament. It's going to be 30, 40, 50 of your final hands by the end of the tournament. So you really need to have that spot down. Now, if somebody cold calls you in mid position, this is a much more rare spot because usually if somebody cold calls you in mid position, now the big line is going to flat you. So it's a multi-way pot, in which case you should not see that as a complete bluff because the majority of the time, both players have not, have not missed. But if you were to get cold called and the blinds folded, the cold caller only has like 12% of hands. That is a third of the hands the big blind has. Do not fire big. Uh, a buddy of mine was nice enough uh, to start telling me, to start teaching me what the solvers say. The solvers are much bigger on small bets versus the cold calling ranges. But to make sure that these large bet sizes are a good idea, I've been taking lessons on GTO solvers and we've been testing bigger bets. Uh, this is just something I pulled from the website, by the way. Don't look, uh, read too much into this. Versus big blinds, versus big blind calling ranges, they do look pretty good. The bigger bets, uh, the solver does not say that though about c betting into cold calling ranges. That's a more varied approach, approach, a much more nuanced approach. What boards should I attack? Uh, this guy's I would take a screenshot of. If, uh, if you would like to. What boards should I attack? Ace high boards should get a small bet because he's either got the ace or he doesn't. So I know it's tempting to read this really quickly as I'm talking, guys, but I'd really encourage you just to listen to me right now because we're going to go through a bunch of different boards and how you can attack them. Since I don't have that much time today, uh, I... I'm going to go through this a little bit more briefly than I would prefer to, but this stuff is very important. So on an ace high board, what is the most exploitative way to play? Well, when you have a really good ace, bet 80% of the pot, because if he has an ace, he's not folding ever. And that pot is going to be so big by the river and he's going to have a really hard time folding, right? And if he has second pair, what usually people do when they have second pair on an ace high board is they'll call they'll call flop and they'll full turn because they assume the second time you fire you have the ace so that first bet should be really big now if you have nothing and again this guy doesn't know you from 
Adam and or this is just someone you don't play with every day or somebody you're running into in a tournament, what you can do is bet like one third pot because that bet needs to work 25% of the time. But that means your opponent needs to defend 75% of the time. That is very unlikely to happen. The really good thing about A side boards is there's no way for your opponent to have over cards. So they usually just have the ace or they don't have it. And if they do have something like 10 9, uh, there's no way for that to be over cards or anything. So any bet will usually fold them out. Unless, of course, they picked up like a gut shot in a backdoor draw or something. But the vast majority of a cold calling range in the big blind is not going to have that. Uh, Two cards nine or higher should also receive a small bet. So people tend to cold call with high cards. They don't call with medium cards. They don't, they don't really like low cards. It's some medium cards and a lot of high cards. So when you see a board with two cards that are nine or higher, that tends to be a little bit covering the cold calling range, right? So. Here's the thing. On those boards, let's say the board comes king, queen, two. A lot of the same things apply that apply on ace high boards. Uh, the person has a really hard time having high cards. The only high card there is an ace. Uh, so there's not, we don't have to worry about big combo draws, having to price them out. The person usually has a king or a queen or they don't. So again, a very small bet will work. If, let's say the person cold called you, in middle position, that might not be the best board to see bet because that is all over the person's cold calling range, right? You might want to back off there, but in the big blind, there's still enough like nine, six suiteds and 10, eight off suits in order to justify a small bet, maybe not half pot. Uh, three cards, nine or below with no straight draw can handle any of the bets we saw today. That is uh, one of my favorite boards. I like to sucker people in with that really small bet, get the like, okay, I don't know what you're doing, call, and then get them to fold on the turn because that's just an extra 200 ships in my pocket. And if you ratchet that up, if you collect those throughout the day in a tournament, that's going to add up to, let's say, nine big blinds at the end of a tournament. That doesn't sound like much, but everybody listening to this has likely come back from nine big blinds at some point in a tournament and made a really serious run of it if they didn't win the tournament. So having that extra nine big blinds is like having a second life in tournament poker. And as you can imagine, if everybody else enters the tournament with one life and you have two lives, that's excellent. So the, these are the fun, most fun boards to manipulate. You can throw in that over bet if you have a pissy young kid. Uh, you can just go for the bigger bet if you just want to spell it out for them. Uh, you can sucker them in with that small bet and then a big bet. Uh, one Broadway, two low cards can handle the same thing generally. Uh, so that's like King XX, Queen XX, uh, Jack XX. Now, if you have a nine in there, right, if it starts putting flush and straight draws out there, uh, you might not want to get as cute with the small bet, but generally the bigger bets will work. But yeah, if it's just King 4 2, again, you could do the over bet, you can do the one third pot size bet, you can do two thirds pot size bet. And flush or straight boards, uh, this is something I don't hear talked about enough, but flush or straight boards are great for double barrels. So get some money in the middle on the flop. You th That is one of the very few situations I really like a half pot bet because what happens is, is someone has a pair of any type on a flush draw board or a straight draw board, they're still going to call if you fire the C-bet. They're just going to hope like hell if the card comes out there on the turn that you're just going to give up. So you fire half pot, the person's going to miss the board enough on three to a suit, as long as it doesn't have two cards nine or higher, three to a suit or three to a straight, seven, six, five, they're going to have missed enough to justify the half pot size bet. But if they do call and the turn is an eight on the seven, six, five board, or the turn is a fourth heart on the three heart board, what happens is they have missed that turn. They did not make a draw 60% of the time minimum. So pretty much any bet out there is going, if you think it's going to fold out the pairs, is going to 
turn a profit so you can fire a little bit more substantially and just pocket what they put in on the middle. So the problem I find when you bet one third pot on those boards is you kind of tell the person, I don't have a big hand. Because if you think about it, if the board came seven, six, five, and you had a set of sixes, you really, it's really unlikely you'd be betting one third pot because you'd be justifiably a bit worried about a straight draw coming in, right? So if you bet half pot, it still looks like you could have a little something. And then you get to pick up a little extra money when you bet the turn. All right, guys, that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed this one. I'll see you for the next one of these. Take care. Good luck to you if you're playing today.